Hi, I'm Matt Chandler here, pastor of the Village Church. Just want to thank you for streaming uh, this sermon uh, on your device. Uh, I, I wanted to, just before we get going here, uh, just lay before you a deep conviction we have that this video sermon uh, that we've prayed really stirs up your affections for Jesus and shapes you and molds you into the image uh, of the Son um, would just be supplemental to your relationship with the Lord and in no way would replace the church you should be plugged into or the pastor that God has put over your life to shepherd and care for your soul. And so please uh, enjoy the next hour or so uh, of this message. We have prayed that God would use it in a profound way in your life. Blessings. If you have your Bibles, would you go ahead and grab them? Let's go to Acts chapter 10. Uh, we've said here for quite a while, in fact, I've tried to use uh, this language in particular because I find it to be uh, most helpful, uh, that the meaning of the word gospel is good news, and for news to be good, it invades dark spaces. And so uh, what I mean when I say that is that uh, really for something to be good news, there has to be the chance for something bad to occur or the reality of something bad that's already in place. And so good news invades the uh, dark spaces, good news invades the bad spaces and sheds light where there isn't any at all. And this is the nature of the gospel. It's what it does. On a thousand different topics, what the gospel does is invade brokenness, mistrust, anger, unforgiveness, hate, fracturing of relationships, and it enters into that brokenness and it reconciles. Now, um, this morning, I want to do what I don't know I've ever heard anyone else do. That's just talk bluntly and straightly about race. You feel that discomfort, that awkwardness? Going to get worse. Because I know some of you are like, man, I am sitting next to a black dude. Dude, don't do this, Chandler. I don't even know what to do right now. And then I know some of you, you African-Americans are like, say something. And, and so in, in the end here, you can already feel kind of this can we do this? Are we, uh, are we allowed to do this? And, and I'm telling you, we're allowed to do it. Um, so I've been pastor here for going on 11 years and um, met, a, met a man. I, I, when you start talking about race and you start talking about racism in particular, I, I think you have to tease out some things because I, I, I think there are, are people who are racist and then I think there are people who are just ignorant. Not to say that racist people aren't ignorant. I'm saying there are people who are racist who don't quite sure know why they are, where that came from. They've been discipled poorly, and it's not their heart, but they just haven't been informed. So let me flesh this out in a way that I think is helpful. Uh, I met a man here um, years ago. By the way, neither one of these families attend the village anymore, so if you're like, I will never tell him anything ever. Um, he, he, he told me that he would never let his daughter marry a black man, and if she did, they would not be welcomed in their home. And I thought, am I watching a civil rights movie right here? Are you the, are you the protagonist? In a, you know, are you the bad guy in the, in the story? Are you serious? Did you just say that out loud? And then, so that, that's just blatant racism, right? That, that's not, oh, bless his heart. It's you are a buffoon. Right now, but there's a subtle form that honestly requires you not to just rebuke outright, but for you to encourage and correct. Um, so about three years after I became the pastor of the village, I was sitting on the front row over at the HV campus service was over and, and a man walked up to me and sat down next to me and just said, hey man, I, I love it here. I'm really thinking about joining this church. Um, I, I just, man, I've got a question. Now at that time we were shifting all sorts of things. And so I had no idea what question I was about to get. And here was his question. Love your preaching, love the worship here, but I don't know what to tell my kids about all these interracial couples. So I went, what do you mean? Because I honestly didn't know what he meant. And so he said, well, doesn't, doesn't the Bible say that we're to come out from them and be separate? Which, now listen to me, he's quoting 
Moses telling the people of Israel as they head into Canaan that they are not to intermarry with the Canaanites who worshiped and served pagan gods. And so somebody in this poor man's trajectory had sat him down, had opened up the word of God, had read that verse and said, this verse means this. And so for our brother who's not going to let his white daughter marry a black man, I got rebuke for him. For our brother who wants to know what to do with these interracial couples, I simply took him to where we'll go here shortly, Ephesians chapter two, and showed him the beauty in it. This is what you tell your kids. You tell your kids that Jesus Christ has broken down the wall of hostility, has restored and established peace, and there's now one race, not two. That's what you tell your kids, and you rejoice in that, right? And, and so do you see what, I say, what I'm saying by there's definitely, listen, there's racism in this room. And it ain't all Anglo. And, and the reality is the gospel enters this tense, how do we approach this, how do we talk about this type of nonsense? And it settles the soul and it settles the ground and it gives us the opportunity to reflect more perfectly what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. But let me establish just a couple of things. And, and before that, let me lay, lay my cards on the, the table. Uh, I think in some ways this is a simple issue. In some ways it's an extremely complex issue. Um, and, and so it, this isn't just about skin color because within groupings of skin color, there's racism, right? And if that kind of is blowing your mind, I'll, I'll unpack it from the Anglo side of things. You got your white collar boys, and you got your rednecks. All right? And then uh, if you look at uh, how African-Americans have historically fleshed this out, it was uh, the house Negro and the field Negro. And don't think, I don't know, some of you right now just went, oh my gosh, he said Negro. <laughs> yeah, but what is that? That's intra-race racism. That's, I am better than you. I am more valuable than you. I have more worth than you. It is a dehumanization of another person and another group of people. That's the essence of racism. In fact, every genocide that has ever occurred, almost all injustice that has ever been birthed has been birthed out of this idea we are superior to. And God help them by birth. Like, what'd you do? You got born. That doesn't make you superior. That you were born? And so in the end, uh, let's just acknowledge this is not just an Anglo issue and this is not a white black issue or a white, Latino, white, Asian, white. With that said, let me also say this. The reality of predominant culture privilege, let me use this word, it'll be helpful. White privilege is a reality. There are doors that are available and open to Anglos that we did not have to kick open that were just normative to us so normative that we don't even know they exist and we'll get offended if someone brings up white privilege. I worked hard. Well, sure you did. But listen to me, brother. There are a whole slew of people who worked hard and didn't get the opportunities you got to outwork that hard work or to work out that hard work. And so white privilege is a reality by the gospel of Jesus Christ. We must seek to deconstruct it and reconstruct in its place the supreme value of every human being, regardless of skin color, background, socioeconomic status, whatever. This is what the gospel does. Now, with my cards on the table, yes, white privilege, absolutely. I've worked around the world too much, worked around this city too much to pretend we all are born with equal footing and if we would just exert the same amount of energy, we would all end up at the same place. You are not seeing the world correctly if that's how you see it. You're not, I love you. You're not seeing the world correctly. If you're an Anglo that's thinking that, then I'm telling you, you're seen because you're Anglo and the only way you know to see is to see as an Anglo. The predominant culture. Predominant cultures just think that everybody has the same opportunities they do and it's not true. It's not. And at the same time, this is not just an Anglo issue. With that said, here's the reality of the human heart. All of us, regardless of color, are drawn towards homogenous units. 
We're drawn towards those like us because to embrace diversity is to lean into uncomfortable conversations, risk being misunderstood, and it takes longer to get from point A to point B in diverse settings. You know who never misunderstands me? You ready for this? 39-year-old white dudes. Never go, what do you mean by that? Never. Right? Because most of us have the same background. We speak the same language. We have experienced the same offenses. And so we're able to speak with one another in a way that doesn't require a lot of clarification. You enter into diversity and the rules change. It's harder work. Things start getting exposed. See, the dirty secret of sanctification that nobody wants to talk about is it hurts. To be matured by God is a painful process or you're doing it wrong. It's the constant, the constant exposing of the wickedness in our hearts before a holy God to be confessed and repented of. That's how we grow. That's how we're sanctified. And that's what we must do around this issue if we've got any real hope of becoming the picture of God's people in a way that most magnifies the beauty of his name. We are drawn towards homogenous units, drawn towards those like us, all of us. Doesn't matter what color you are, this is the draw. We don't drift towards diversity, we drift away from it. And even people who have had points in their lives where they've anchored down, and I'm not a racist, will find themselves drifting towards homogeny will find themselves drifting towards those just like them. I'll show it to you in the Bible. So Acts chapter 10, we'll pick it up in verse 28. Let me set up the story. Um, uh, the apostle Peter um, is uh, in Joppa at Simon the Tanner's house doing ministry. Uh, in Caesarea, uh, a, a few uh, blocks away, not a few blocks away, but quite a few days journey away, uh, a man named Cornelius of the Italian cohort. So here's what I need you to hear me say. A non-Jew. Uh, Gentile, perceived by the Jews to be unclean and second class, has a vision and an angel of the Lord says to him, send for Simon at Simon of Joppa's house and bring him to yours. And so uh, this God-fearing Gentile sends a group of soldiers to get Peter. Peter at that same time is up on the roof praying and he becomes hungry. And as his belly kind of rattles, a blanket, he has this vision and a blanket is lowered from heaven. And in that blanket was all sorts of animals and unclean things that the Jews viewed as what they would call um, common or dirty or unclean, things that they were forbidden by law to touch. And a voice spoke, kill and eat. And Peter's got a little post-traumatic stress syndrome, all right? That's what happens when Jesus calls you the devil. All right, you don't get over being called by Jesus, Satan, without going, what do I do here? All right, so the blanket is lowered, kill and eat. And Peter, trying not to be Peter, becomes Peter and argues with the voice. So God says, kill and eat. And he's like, I've never touched what is unclean. I'm not eating that stuff. And God goes, if I made it, it's not unclean. If I made it, it ain't common. And at that, there was a knock at the door. The knock at the door were the men from Cornelius' house. The next day, Peter and Cornelius' men head back to Caesarea to meet with Cornelius. Now, we're going to pick it up in Acts chapter 10, verse 28. Here's, here's Peter's, hey guys, to the room of Gentiles. And he said to them, you yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or to visit anyone of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any persons common or unclean. Now, let me tell you why that verse doesn't unsettle us. It doesn't unsettle us because we said Jew or Gentile. It will unsettle us if you put white and black in there. All right, so if we take this back, because this sounds like some Jim Crow nonsense. 
That's what it sounds like. You yourselves know that it is illegal, unlawful for me to eat with someone from another nation. So what, what, if we can get our heads around this, this is a, a white dude walking into the living room surrounded by a bunch of African Americans and saying, you yourselves know it's illegal for me to associate or eat with you, but God has shown me that you are not unclean. I mean, I get nervous for that brother. Like, man, I hope you kiss your family goodbye, dude. You're about to get worked. Right? That, that's what just happened. This is a race issue. That's what's happened here. You've got God beginning to break down this wall between the Jews and the Gentiles. And if you don't know who the Gentiles are, they are us. What do you mean by us? I mean all of us. Any non-Jew is a Gentile and God is beginning to break down the walls between the Jews and the rest of the nations to create a new man, to create a new people. And so Peter goes from there. Um, they, they respond kindly by just explaining the vision. Peter goes, okay, I'll preach the gospel, see what happens. And here's where we'll pick it up in verse 44. While Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. And the believers from among the circumcised, that's Jews, who had come with Peter were amazed because of the gifts of the Holy Spirit that were poured out even on the Gentiles. For they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter declared, can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to remain for some days. Now listen, you know you're preaching when you don't even get done and the Holy Ghost falls and people start speaking in tongues and get saved. Like Peter didn't even get to get to his third point. He had studied that week, was ready, had a cool little poem to tie it all off with. He's in the middle of the second point, ghost falls, tongues, everybody's getting baptized. And so what an epic moment, if you can imagine. I mean, so listen, we're, a lot of us are church folk. What if like right now, right now I'm 15 minutes into this message. What if right now the Holy Ghost were to fall on us in such a way that there'd be no need for me to say anything else and we'd be caught up in who God is and salvation would be birthed and repentance would come out, not just because of the preaching of the word, but because God simply dumped himself out on us. That's what just happened. That's a soul stirring, like as a minister, that's a do that every weekend kind of thing. And so Peter, it doesn't say it, so this conjecture, he's got to be hopped up and a bit nervous. These are the first Gentile believers. Again, a little PTSD for my boy. I mean, he's just constantly been rebuked, constantly made mistakes. Now here he is baptizing Gentiles. And our boy Peter, who's not known for his spine, shows back up in Jerusalem. And here's what we'll read in 11, 1 through 4. Now the apostles and the brothers who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, listen to this, the circumcision party criticized him saying, listen to what their accusation was. You went to uncircumcised men and ate with them? Now that's crazy, isn't it? I mean, here the Holy Ghost had poured out. Men and women had been saved, had come into the family of faith. He gets back to Jerusalem, and here's the criticism that awaits. You ate with who? Who'd you eat with? Now, Peter, again, not known for his spine. He's not having it. So in a rare act of bravery until later on in Peter's life, he digs his heel in. God gave me a vision. God gave him a vision. God did this. You got a problem. You take it up with God. So you're like, man, Peter's in on this, man. It's racial reconciliation, dude. He's our guy. You know, he's the, he's the Jew guy helping us out with the rest of the Jews telling them it's a new day. And yet, because of our sinfulness, we always drift back towards homogeny. We don't tend to stay rooted in diversity. It's uncomfortable. We tend to offend. Things get difficult. We're misunderstood. We don't like to do the hard work required. And so he drifts. And so we read this in Galatians 2. I'll put it on the screen so you can see it. But when Cephas, that's Peter, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, 
so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in front of them all, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? So let me paint the picture. All right, Peter shows up in Antioch. He's hanging out with the Gentiles, all right? Eating a bacon sandwich, learning new music, all right? Trying to figure out how, where that beat falls and rises because with the Jews, it works like this, all right? But now it's on the different beat and I can't even do it right now, all right? And so in the end, this is what, and he's loving it and he's with them. And then the Jews roll in and he walks away from that. And he's saying, you shouldn't be eating pork sandwiches and you've got to become like us. So the predominant culture says back to the subdominant culture, for you to be accepted, you must learn to live in our world. Here is our music. Here is our food. Here is what we do. And if you're going to be a part of us, you must become like us. And Paul's like, bro, you were just eating a bacon sandwich. Listening to Tupac. How are you going to say that now? I mean, that's what just happened. And he did it to his face in front of everyone, which makes me wish I was there. I mean, you want to talk about awkward. Peter, can you stand up for a second? Peter probably thinks he's about to teach, like Paul's about to go tell him. But instead, he confronts him to his face in front of everyone. Remember that bacon sandwich you were eating? How now will you tell our brothers they're not allowed to eat bacon? He exposes his hypocrisy. But here's, here's what we need to lean into now. He says in this text that homogenized, separated, separate communities are not in step with the gospel. Now, what does that mean? Go over to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, 1 through 10 are epic. They're a build out of the gospel. Verse 11 starts one of the main implications of the gospel for those of us who believe. Starting in verse 11, therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Simply put, this means that the Gentiles were not looking for a savior. The Gentiles were not looking at the promises of God and going, one day a Messiah will come that fixes all of this. They simply weren't looking forward to that day like the Jews were. And God's about to say, who cares? From there... 13, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ for he himself is our peace who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself, listen to this, one new man. If you write in your Bible, highlight that, circle that, that becomes profound for where we're going on this issue, that he might create one new man in the place of two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. Two things I want to point out here in this text. First, Paul is using extremely pointed language around this idea. What he's saying here is in the first century Herodian temple, where the Jews worship, there were uh, courts and outer walls. And the first gate you would walk through would be the gate of the Gentiles. And you could walk around in that court if you were a God-fearing Gentile. And then there was another gate. And if you were a Jewish woman who was by their standard of cleanliness, a clean woman, you could enter into through the next gate, the inner court, not the innermost court, but the inner court that was made up for Jewish women. And then the inner court where the presence of God was for the Jew was for Jewish men who were ceremonially cleansed and had obeyed the law to the point where they could go in there without fear of death. Now, um, archaeologists several years ago found this inscription in the wall of the outermost court, the court of the Gentiles, and here's what it read. Whoever is captured past this point will have himself to blame for his subsequent death. You want to talk hostility? 
So again, maybe that doesn't land on us. Maybe we've got to change the language. If you can imagine just a chiseled into the stone on the wall, black man, climb this wall and you have only yourself to blame for your death. Latino man, climb this wall and you'll have only yourself to blame for your death. Asian brother, climb this wall and you will have only for yourself death by your own foolishness to cross this. So when Paul says to a group of people that worship at the Herodian temple, when, when he says to them that Christ has broken down by his blood the dividing wall of hostility, he's saying this nonsense is over. It's done by the blood of Christ. Now how and why is it over? Well, he tells us. Because what God has done is he has taken what was two and he has made it one. So let me try to unpack that just a bit. There are two Greek words for one. The Greek word in this text for one is the Greek word kainos, all right? And, and kainos, properly defined, means this, of a new kind, unprecedented, novel, uncommon, unheard of. So maybe this will help. A good friend of mine puts it this way. This is not the 2014 Ford Explorer. This is the Model T. That help? You tracking with this? This isn't a new version of what was old. This is something that is brand new. So what is brand new? What is brand new is that God has taken what was many and he has created what was one so that what he has is a people. He has a people. Now, when we walk in diverse relationships, um, God really... Um, he really exposes some things and does some work in our hearts. Like I can tell you, one of the first things that will be created in the heart of those who walk in diverse relationships is a heart of humility. Um, several years ago, uh, a, a friend of mine, pastor, leaned over and he said, hey man, can I ask you a, a question? I don't, I don't, I don't want to be offensive though. So like that's always a bit of a nerve-wracking situation, isn't it? Hey man, I don't want to offend you, but I need to ask a question. And so I said, go ahead. He said, all right, man. Why... Why is white folk worship so morose? I said, what do you mean? He's like, do you guys not celebrate the Lord? I mean, you know you can celebrate, right? You don't always have to be sad and dark in the room. And I mean, why are you guys always sad? I mean, he's risen from the grave. And so listen, I wasn't offended. I was intrigued because I was like, bro, we just, we thought we just rocked that joint out. I mean, I'm so confused right now because I thought we blew that thing up in there. Listen to me, man. There's some white older dudes in there right now going, this is ridiculous, all right? So I don't know what, I'm confused. And so my very gracious, loving friend said, Ty Trebet, start listening to him and come back. Here's Charles Jenkins. I just want to help you, brother, see some things. And so, man, I, I listened to both of those and here's what I thought, eh. Like I couldn't figure it out. I couldn't figure out how to get in. It was just a different rhythm. I was like, how do I... I didn't know how to get into that up, down, beat. I, I couldn't understand. I'm like, do I sing with the lead guy? Do I sing with the choir? How do I, who do I sing with? I'm just confused. <laughs> and then over a period of time, I started to love it. And then here's what happened to me. What else do I not know? What else do I not know about us Anglos because I'm an Anglo? And, and so here's what started to happen to me. I need help. I need help. I, I don't know. And, and listen, if we've got any shot at legitimate racial reconciliation, it cannot be driven by white guilt. It cannot be driven, it must, not, not by the need to feel like we need to rescue or pay back. It must be built upon, pushed forward by the gospel of Jesus Christ that is far from paternalistic and says, help me, brother. Help me, sister. I want to understand. I don't. I, give, I lay that down. I don't understand. Help me. And again, listen, if this crowd becomes more diverse, that's not a win if we hadn't become diverse in our relationships. Listen, we're, it, what an epic fail if this room had all these different colors, but our friendship stayed homogenized. What if we won? Nothing. Nothing. The wall of hostility has been broken down because God has created a new man. And so that Tower of Babel monument to self-nonsense should die among the people of God. should die. It's going to be hard work. It's long suffering. Anglos, you're going to have to find other peoples to be friends with, to grow in friendship with. And I know some of you are thinking right now, Chandler, are you really telling me just to find a black dude and say, be my friend? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I am. I am. 
And if you're African-American, Latino, and Asian here, just let me apologize. I had a friend come up to me last night. I was like, man, I had like 20 white people come up tonight and give my phone number. <laughs> I was like, I'm sorry, man. You really expect me to be friends with 20 white people? I'm like, yeah, until we get numbers. Yes, yes, I do. And, and so in the end, this must be fought for, must be worked for. And then listen, if you are uh, African-American, Latino, Asian, hear me. We're going to say dumb stuff. Don't push away from the table. It's not our heart, I promise. Now, if there's legitimate racism here, we'll find it as your elders and we'll stamp it out. No place for that in the house of God. You are welcomed and loved here. Be patient with us. Help us. Listen, it happens all the time. I know you can look around here and just go, gosh, these just aren't my people. No, brother, sister, we are your people. And we need your help. And, and we need to be guided and we need to be confronted and we need to lovingly be rebuked and we need to be encouraged and we need to... It's not a white-only issue. Seriously, the white people can't say, it's better, can we? We're doing better. <laughs> we can. Are you not supposed to say that if you're a white dude? It's better out there for other races. Shut up. You're a predominant culture. What do you know? That there's more black people on TV? That's what you're... We must lean in. We must be willing to say, don't say that. I trust your heart here, brother. You should not say that. Let me tell you what I hear when you say he's so articulate. Let me tell you what I hear when you say that. And we have the grace to receive it and they have the courage to say it without pushing away from the table. When we walk in these relationships, humility is birthed on both sides. The gospel is seen most beautifully. We have harmed each other. The black eye on American history revolves around race relations. And so I, if I get the opportunity to sit across a table at a restaurant around here, in Flower Mound, Highland Village in particular, that's you know, whiter than rice, <laughs> and can sit across and model that this is my friend, to have into my home, to go into the home, to be friends with those who are not. Don't we display in such a homogenized part of the world that the gospel heals, that the gospel works, that the gospel saves and reconciles and weaves together what was broken? It does. And then listen, it will reveal our wickedness over and over and over again. It'll give us the opportunity to repent. And the opportunity to repent is a gift from God. I want to read this email and then I want to show you, um, I want to show you quickly a video and then I'm, we're going to pray a little bit. So this was written um, from one of our covenant members to one of our black pastors. I've, I love this email since I saw it. He forwarded it to me and said, you got to read this. I think we're making headway. Here's his email. We were glad to have you over. After you left that night, Spencer wanted to talk to me. He told me that all the people we've met with really dark skin seem really cool, and I'd really like to have a younger brother who is black. It would seem that you are making a good impression on my children. In fact, he prays every night that we would adopt a kid to fit his mental picture. A, a little younger than him, maybe seven or eight years old, and B, black. You know, it's strange that as I write this, I mention your race and I feel anxiousness. In so few areas of my life do I worry about using the right words to avoid offending people, but I do in this one. Generally, I'm more like a bull in a china shop with my mouth. Some of this comes from our inputs like news, movies, and other cultural stuff. And some of it comes from my knowing friends that perceive every glancing look as racism. I wonder if this fear of giving off an aura of racism actually leads to a perception of it. Like if I'm afraid to look at you on the bus because you're black, which might cause you to think that I'm staring, this instead begins to be perceived as that dude won't look at me because he's afraid of me. He's a racist. Even though I'm talking with honesty here, part of me wonders how this will be accepted as an email. That anxiousness or fear of talking about race in anything more than general terms is making it worse, I think. I guess I just see a spiraling problem 
And I know that you took this job, at least in part, to help heal some of that wound our country still obviously faces. I love his conclusion. Anyways, if I've offended you, I'm sorry. That was clearly not my intent. If you want to grab lunch sometime and talk more about it or not talk about it at all, let me know. I have some more thoughts on the topic, but I'm at work and need to get some lunch down. Now, this is leaning in. Did you hear it? This is leaning. I, I'm getting anxious to talk about this. Is it safe here to talk about this with you? I don't want to be perceived as a racist, but I don't understand. Can I ask this? Is this how it works? Is this a problem? And now you've got a full-on relationship beginning to happen here. One that shows the beautiful reality of the reconciling work of Jesus Christ that can cover the most heinous of sins, the most heinous of oppression, the most heinous of injustice, that he has taken from the many and he has made one. Let me tell you a little bit more of our story. I graduated from Texas City High School in 1993. Uh, directly across the street from our high school's football stadium was the First Baptist Church of Texas City. I actually came to know Christ at that church. Uh, the church was beautifully positioned just uh, a block away from the high school and directly across the street from the high school football stadium. Uh, we are in Texas. It, it is what makes the, the town you know, exist. It was the thing we could all rally around. And, and I noticed something after my conversion that I'd never noticed before it. Um, on Friday nights, that parking lot um, would be filled with African Americans and whites and Latinos and wealthy people and poor people and every type of diversity imaginable, all piling into that parking lot to walk across the street to watch a football game. Now what struck me after my conversion and as I became a member of that church was that the parking lot on Sunday morning looked completely different than the parking lot on Friday night. As diverse and, and as different as it was on Friday night, it was completely homogenized on Sunday morning. On Sunday morning, 100% of the faces and the people in that parking lot were white. You know, it's interesting, whenever you read a history book of the United States, Almost every historian will say that the black eye of United States history, morally speaking, has been race relations. And, and, and whether that's the expulsion of Native Americans or it's the way that we had race-based slavery from the very beginning, that that's the black eye of our conscience and of our soul as a country. And of course the church, sadly enough, has been so complicit in various different ways, whether that was aggressively or passively, or consciously or unconsciously, in that. And, uh, and that's what's led so many people, even the president a few years ago, to say what sociologists and others have been saying for so many years, that the most segregated hour in America still seems like it's Sunday mornings when churches are gathered and gathered mostly along uh, ethnic lines. And so it's just tragic and it shouldn't be this way. Look at how we're living our lives. We run with people who look like us, who value what we value. When all said and done, although we wouldn't say with our mouths that we believe that our race is superior to other races, we do not value differences. We do not, we're not drawn towards diversity. So we're not racist, but we run with a bunch of other white people. We're not racist, but we run with uh, just black people. We're not racist, but our crew is predominantly Latino. And sure, we'll have a token one here or there, but only because they act like us or walk like us or think like us. And so it really is a problem. Although political correctness has taken it out of our mouths, it has not taken it out of our hearts nor our lives. So I grew up in a house, um, uh, son of uh, two Mexican immigrants. Um, so I was really, my life was saturated with Mexican culture. There was this danger of, you know, ideas and thoughts being put in my mind about, about the, the majority culture and you know, shortcomings that they had or views that they had of us, um, in particular me and my family or, or me and Mexican people. We took a test in, um, in high school and I remember they broke the results down by um, by race. So they had Asian, white, 
black Hispanic, something of that sort. And that ranking that they did that showed the results of the test produced a lot of controversy in the school. So uh, I remember a particular guy saying that he was smarter than um, a certain people. So he was like, I'm smarter than y'all. I think that was the first time um, that viewing other races um, became something uh, of substance. I grew up in Lake Oswego, Oregon, which is a suburb of Portland. And in my high school of 1,200 people, we had um, four African-American students. Uh, and so race, diversity, um, anything other than a homogenous culture was just not something I was confronted with or thought about. All of my friends, all of um, my neighbors, everybody I knew was just the same. Um, I'm originally from Memphis, Tennessee. And Memphis is a very culturally diverse city, um, an awesome arts city, but is very racially divided. Lots of corruption um, on the local governmental level, as well as police brutality. I grew up witnessing that, seeing that, seeing the divisions in the city. I mean, what's beautiful is that, that diversity is something that God created before the fall, something that was actually rooted in his own character, that he's God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, three and yet one, diverse and yet one and unified within himself. And so this spills out onto creation where he's creating night and day and he's creating light and dark and land and sea and on and on you could go right up to mankind, male and female. And so at the beginning, out of an overflow of his character, God creates diversely, and he intends for it to be beautiful long before the fall happens. So, so now because of sin, we're looking for our identity to fix our insecurity and in all sorts of things, even the color of our skin, but Jesus steps on the scene and says, hey, listen, your, your life is me. Your salvation is found in me. It's not found in your tribe or your tongue or your, your, your age or your job or anything especially your race, it's found only in me. And in me, these differences can become beautiful again. So for a long time, I didn't think um, that I had any racist thoughts. I, I knew that they existed, but I didn't think I subscribed to them. Uh, the Lord was uh, really faithful to reveal some areas of my heart where I did do those things, where I um, qualitatively distinguished between uh, races. I thought this was, was uh, not something that, that corresponded to me, but it totally did. So when I I'd felt the weight of that, I, I realized, you know, this isn't, this isn't right. This is, this is um, sinful and I need to repent. I come from a background where there was a lot of fast and um, upbeat tempos. And, um, and so at the end of every service or um, right when worship would begin, I would actually leave and I would take communion and, and leave and told myself that it was okay if I listened to my own worship music and praise music when I got home. And if I was going to be a part of the church, if I was um, going to come here and listen to the message and, um, and be a part of this body, that I needed to be a part of this body and actually be in the service, not just for when Matt preaches or whoever's preaching at that time, but be in a home group. Um, participate in worship and worship with the church. And by the end of that transition, I felt myself falling in love with the way, um, this new way of worship um, that I never even considered. Um, the gospel helped me um, see how much better it was and helped me see the grace of God that was uh, our differences um, and embracing those and helping those and using those to learn more um, about him, about me, um, and even about how to do life better to honor them. Yeah, so as we've begun to just reflect on the gospel and its implications for our lives being racially reconciled, I mean, it's led us into a great amount of prayer as a campus, as individuals, and, uh, and, and the Lord has been so gracious in so many different ways, personally and corporately, to, to lead us into stretching ourselves, stretching our preferences, whether that's relationally or musically or whatever the case may be, that, man, if this is ultimately something that's tied to the gospel, then it requires our movement and our prayer. And so as we've done that, the Lord's been so gracious to bring us to a place where uh, we're continually growing and understanding what it really means to consider others more important than ourselves. 
the the idea of diversity at the Village Church it really sort of opened my eyes to uh, an entire uh, entirely different genre of music, uh, entirely different expressions of uh, worship to the Lord through music, uh, and so more than trying to um, cater to any specific uh, ethnicity or preference, we really wanted to. Um, celebrate what God had been doing here and highlight what He had been doing and use music as a way to do that uh, and to really prefer our brothers and sisters and to love them uh, by preferring them in a different musical genre. So the ultimate goal is not to have this type of music on the stage. The ultimate goal is to have these types of relationships in living rooms, in dining rooms, and in home groups. Have the end in mind and, and thinking, you know, we can have a glimpse of what heaven will look like. Um, and all it's going to cost me is stumbling through a couple conversations with people that are different than me. And that's not, that's not a hefty price to pay to experience um, what um, the Bible says that we'll experience in heaven. So, yeah, maybe learn a couple of phrases in a different language or be okay with trying new food or be okay with welcoming people into your house that you're not exactly sure if you're going to offend them with something that you do, that's okay. It's worth feeling uncomfortable for a little while. It, it's not about you. It's not about what you like or what you don't like. And um, it's definitely something that um, the Holy Spirit had to remind me of, is that it's about God getting the glory. And, um, and it really doesn't matter um, what avenue He chooses to do that in. I was really broken. I came really, really broken and really, really crushed. The village didn't, they just would not leave me alone. <laughs> um, people came up to me and say, I'm so glad that you're here. I see you with your family every week and um, I just appreciate you being here and we wanna know who you are. Would you come to dinner? Would you, can we hang out? Can we spend some time? part of my healing. Um, people, they pursued my heart. They wanted to know who I was. They wanted to know who my family was, what our passions were. Um, and it was just a tremendous part of breaking that heart of stone and the Lord, you know, restoring a heart of flesh. And so now that, you know, our lives together are becoming more and more reconciled. I just can't even imagine um, not having relationships with people that are different than me and not being in a church that has the richness of um, different races and ages and socioeconomic brackets coming together to be one in Christ. And so the fruit in my life has been that now that I've tasted just a little bit of what heaven's going to be like, I, I can't even imagine being a part of a church or being a part of a community in my own life personally that that's not the case as much as the Lord would allow. Yeah, amen. So I wanted to, I wanted us to spend some time together this morning. I, I think the first thing we, we need to do just as we move towards con communion um, is to spend a little bit of time in confession. Um, so it's been an interesting message to preach because um, there have been some real awkward services. I mean, there's just been nervousness, and um, but then there's been these really beautiful moments. And, and as I was, uh, my family attends the 715, and as we were, um, I was getting my kids. This just feels like home to them, so they were running crazy in here. And as I was leaving last night, there was a, uh, a young white man up in the, the bleacher seats over there just sobbing, an African-American young man praying over him and encouraging him. And, and, and I think, man, we need to spend some time just in confession. And I don't care what color you are, and I don't care what your background is, I don't know what's happened to you or hadn't happened to you. Almost all of us have some spots in our lives where we're like, Lord, forgive me. I have presumed on your name, I've presumed against your people. I have judged harshly others. And we need to confess that. And, and the reason I started out with the illustration of the man that said, if, a, if, a, a, if my youngest daughter married a black man, he wouldn't be welcome in some, is because for, for some of you, that's, that's gonna be an issue. And that issue should reveal something about your heart. Like, why is that a deal at all? 
So there are these little markers that expose us. And let's confess them. Just lay them before the Lord. Unless you're content with your heart being there, and then I just kind of pity you, feel sorry for you. And I will tell you, you you're walking in a way that is not in step with the gospel. You are thinking in a way that's not in step with the gospel. You are living in a way that is not in step with the gospel. And so I want to give you about four or five minutes here just to confess those things before the Lord. And, and if you're comfortable, maybe even turn to somebody you came with and, and just say, man, pray for me. My heart's a wreck on this. But listen to me, own it. Can't go anywhere if you don't own it. Can't go anywhere if you're like, I'm not a racist. I just don't have any friends of any other color. <laughs> you got to own it, man. Maybe what you're owning is just you've been lazy. Maybe what you're owning is that you're not giving Anglos a shot again. Maybe what you, what, what you need to own is bitterness, resentment, and unforgiveness at the predominant culture. But we all have something to own here. And if you're like, I don't think I do, then I'm going to ask you to ask the Holy Spirit like David did to reveal to you what you need to own. There's no place for this nonsense in the church, no place for this nonsense in the kingdom of God. There is one man name, one man now. And we can celebrate our cultural backgrounds and we can celebrate our cultural trophies, but hear me, the book of Revelation says that on that day we'll throw those crowns down at his feet and we'll worship together. So just a few minutes here, you, where you are, let's just confess our sins before the Lord. We have been indifferent. We have been bitter. We are a racist. We do have prejudices. Let's ask the Lord for help. Let's ask the Lord that this church might be a church marked by intimate, deep relationships that cross all kinds of lines, the lines of color, the lines of socioeconomic status. This is not just an um, external physical color issue. This is a cultural issue. This is a status, socioeconomic status issue. Our lives are richer more full and mirror more fully the saving work of Jesus Christ when our close friends, when those we do life with, mirror out that there is one that has moved profoundly and powerfully on our lives, that he becomes our identity, that he becomes the definer of our lives, and he becomes the one that lets us know who family is. Let's ask him to do it here. And, and I know the demographics of this place. I, I know that if we were to truly be that diverse at our size in this location, we're going to need a supernatural act of the Holy Spirit. Well, let's pray it. We've been told about 30 times since I became the pastor here that something was logistically impossible because of demographics or because of size. And every time the Lord's kicked open that door and snickered at its impossibility. So let's pray and ask him to draw unto this place. African-Americans, Latinos, Asians, for our good, for his glory, not just to be in this room, but to be in one another's lives.
Father, help us. If you don't help us, what will we do? This is bigger than us, Father. This can't be a shot of adrenaline. You have to change our hearts, so help us. Holy Spirit, do the sweet work of illumination. Even now, I guarantee there's just fights in our minds in this room that we don't want to believe that we are prejudiced. We don't want to believe that we are racist. We don't want to believe that, that we are bitter, that we won't let go of hate. We don't want to believe that that's who we are, and yet it is who we are. And so expose us. Be unrelenting in our heart right now, Holy Spirit. I pray not just that we would know these things to be true, Father, but that we begin to act upon them. I pray that we'd enter into awkward conversations. I pray we wouldn't be quick to leave, Father. You'd give us eyes that would look around, find those different than us, and begin to build relationships, Father. Not that we would just know that we should, but that we would act upon, Father. And I know we'll need to revisit this over and over and over again, but create in this place what only you can create in this place. As Ephesus needed to be reminded, so do we. As he reminded the church at Corinth, so we will need to be reminded. As he had to rebuke Peter, so we will often have to be rebuked. Help us, Lord. For the glory of your name, for the beauty of the gospel, and for our deep joy, help us. It's for your beautiful name that I pray. Amen.